in my neck of the woods, I'm at the Juilliard School. Uh, I'm my uh, title is Director of Lifelong Learning. And what I do there is head the Juilliard Evening Division. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that is. And then we'll go into some of the impacts we've been facing uh, in, the rec in recent months. So let me just share my screen here. Uh, do... So sort of the idea um, that I've been uh, thinking through the past since really March 9th is the date for me. Everybody has their own date for when the global pandemic began to really affect them. And so, so uh, the early March is when it really began for us. So um, thinking through uh, what we want to talk about today. So just to kind of a map of what we'll talk about, I'll give you an overview of the evening division and then our transition to online instruction. And really now we've had a little bit of distance from when that began. So we're beginning to think about the opportunities and decisions we have to make for the future. And I think since I'm the last uh, presenter today, we'll go into a group discussion after that. So what is the Juilliard Evening Division? Um, it's about 90 years old. And basically what we do in the Evening Division is we offer a wide array of courses uh, taught by faculty from Juilliard in dance, music, and drama. And these, these courses, um, they can be one day intensive or year long. They can be um, lectures. They can be performance-based courses and piano, voice, violin. And basically, it's continuing education uh, for the Juilliard School. And uh, it's a well-established um, sort of foundational component of continuing education in both New York City uh, and as at part of Juilliard. And then what happened, um, in the recent months has really changed the fundamental nature of what we do. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. But be to give you an idea of the scope of who we serve, there's, here's a, a snapshot of Juilliard Evening Division by the numbers. So um, you can see we've had uh, around between 700 and 650 or so students this year at various points, um, running about 88 courses a uh, semester, uh, over 30 in the summer. But the key thing that will impact the rest of what I want to share today um, is that over 60% of the Juilliard Evening Division students are over the age of 65 years old. And so you'll hear me um, echoing some of what Leigh was saying earlier about the aging population. So we, we definitely serve an aging population. <laughs> and the pandemic, uh, as it came and really impacted the entire world, had very different and special implications for seniors. So um, when, we, when things were beginning to shut down, we had to make some decisions. And I thought it would be valuable for everyone in the group today to think sort of through the, to illustrate the framework of the decision-making process that we had um, back in March. And because I think it is not just as a response to the coronavirus. I think it actually turned out to be a pretty good um, model to think about change in organizations uh, and creative experiences and making and new ways to present and uh, meet challenges. So um, we have this sort of framework. It's called Challenges to Online Learning Design, um, but it's really multifaceted and can be applied to a lot of situations. So the first, it's, I think of it as a pinwheel. Um, and so the first sort of piece of the pinwheel over here is to assess the competing imperatives. So it's March, we have, you know, 600 something students, mostly over the age of 65 who are used to coming into the, to the, our building for in-person courses, uh, in-person lessons, chamber music, that sort of thing. And we were going to have to go um, remotely. That was the only option we had. To put that into perspective, in Juilliard's over 100 year history, there have never been online classes at the school. So the evening division, I, we looked up one day and, and I realized that our division was going to have to be the first in over a century to bring remote learning uh, in a large scale way to Juilliard. So that was a, a sort of a looming over um, my team as we began to do this. And so we looked at some of the competing imperatives. We had, we had 
time. You know, James was just mentioning how quickly they had to transition their online convening or their convening to online. And um, we were actually on our spring break at the time. So we had about seven days to get uh, all 80 of those classes um, converted to online. So some of the imperatives we had were um, not only time, but also looking at the techno technological um, skills of our faculty and also of our students and thinking through how are we going to find an inclusive structure for them. We also had issues around the platform and, and what platforms were the best suited for our group because there's a lot of inherent ageism in technological design where it, there, there's many assumptions about uh, what it, how you use something, and it's built on the premise that a lot of people use technology frequently, but there are a lot of members of our uh, population who don't use maybe more than email on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, so things, so a lot of learning management software that's designed for, if you may be familiar with like a Canvas or a Blackboard or something like that, that's actually not very inherent, uh, very apparent how it works for people who maybe don't use technology on a regular basis. So we had these things that we were kind of, we decided we would just list them and think through and rank, you know, what are the barriers from the strongest, um, the biggest barrier to sort of the, the most easily to over, overcome. Then the next kind of portion of this pinwheel was we needed to create a vision for online learning um, that was appropriate. So when I say appropriate, you have to think through, can the experience still be viable and fulfilling? And I want to think uh, just about that for a moment because um, there's, as we kind of go into this new age of, uh, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but as we go into this new age, there it, and we had this push to really get things up and running so quickly, there was this like push to just get stuff up and get it going. Um, and what we ended up in many cases creating is thinking, well, how do we do what we do in, in a classroom or live online? And so it became for many people a goal of, you know, let's just, let's just do, let's just film whatever we were going to do in the classroom, put it online. And so I actually say, uh, I chose the word appropriate very carefully there because I want to find a way to create experiences that are fulfilling, that are appropriate to the medium, that are appropriate to the age group, um, to the student body itself. Um, so it was thinking about designing to the needs uh, of the moment at that time. And then the next piece of this pinwheel was we could have a, a we had agreed upon Zoom as our medium. We had, you know, started ushering faculty to reformat and think through some of the parameters of what they were going to do in their class and how we were, they were going to transition that to online. And we were putting all this effort into it, but it also was very apparent to us that a really clear communication plan with our learning community in mind was really important. And uh, making sure that people understand what they're about to do. And I think that has a bigger implication for creating um, interactive experiences, not just online learning, but, but online concerts and online lectures and any number of things that we are trying to do in a digital space now, or even a hybrid version of digital and in-person. People need to understand what they're going to be doing, how they're going to experience this. Um, what we found is that the mystery is not appealing. And so people want to understand the space they're going to be in. Just as like if you sign up for a class somewhere, say you sign, you know, in the fall semester, you sign up for a class at your local community center or um, in our case, the Juilliard School, you understand that that means you're going to get on a bus or a train, you're gonna to go to 65th Street, you're gonna walk into the building, you might be in the lobby, and you're gonna go sit in a classroom, and you understand that there are gonna be desks and chairs and a blackboard, sort of like what's at the background of this picture. And you understand what that experience is going to be like, but we can't also say to people, well, we're gonna do this online thing now, and it's gonna be great, just click here, without sort of socializing and telling them what we plan on doing. And, there are inherent fears. Will it be too difficult? Will I feel foolish because I don't understand the technology? Will I make a fool of myself because I'll 
you know, unmute myself and not know what to do and, and not know how to get it back and embarrass myself in front of other people. So we have to communicate what the plan is and have a clear expectation of what the experience will be. And then the last piece of my pinwheel uh, here is you can have a really, uh, you can think through all of the things you need to think through around what, um, what's driving your decision making. You can create a vision that has all the curriculum and all the content and all the bells and whistles you want to include. You can tell everybody about that plan, but if you don't go back on the fourth kind of part here of the pinwheel, which connects back to the beginning, if you don't find a number of ways for people to participate, you will have effectively created a giant wall between you and your audience or your students or you know, whoever your group is, um, that they feel they can't um, uh, penetrate. And that's really something that is uh, ironic about online instruction is that you know, the internet is supposed to be our great connector, but if we don't really design for participation, it actually becomes another third wall um, between you and the people that you're, you're working with. So really ensuring that there's a plurality of ways for students um, to participate. So I look at it as sort of a cycle. Uh, and it's helpful to think of it that way. And it's, there's no, it's not linear. There's no start or finish to the process. Uh, for me, it's a constant reevaluation, a constant going through this cycle of what are the barriers now? How do we remove barriers? You know, how do we uh, adapt our vision to make sure that it's appropriate to those barriers as well as our goals for learning? How do we communicate those changes, what we're doing? And then, how you know how is it playing out in reality are people participating is the satisfaction high are are people engaged and then that feedback goes back to okay that's a new uh imperative and so on so i think of it as a pinwheel and a cycle um so opportunities for the future so one of the things that i um wanted to think about today um just and since i'm the last one today i think it's a nice for it's a nice segue into the conversation um, that we're going to have. But I read a really fantastic article that I wanted to share a few points from uh, here and um, think, through, think through together. So um, Doug McLennan, who uh, is Seattle-based, actually, James, I'm sure you know who he is. Uh, he, he's a very uh, prominent uh, arts blogger and critic, and uh, he runs Arts Journal. He, he uh, recently did a speech for the Opera America Conference called How Top Technology is Shaping Opera. And it's on the Diacritical blog from May 18th. So you can find it um, there. And it was really groundbreaking because um, the, the global pandemic that we've experienced, um, one common theme we saw was many people talking about the impact of, of you know, COVID-19 and how it's really, it's devastating the arts economy and it's, it's devastating uh, you know, in-person experiences. And I think one of the interesting things that, that um, he talks about that I think is relevant to this conversation today is that um, actually the global pandemic has just laid bare some of the, fr the structural fragilities uh, in the arts and uh, in, in already in our existence. Um, it has sh our structures for um, revenue, our structures for engagement, our content choices, the way we get feedback from our audiences to shape their experience, um, it really just sort of hyper realized a lot of those flaws. And so now we're forced to address them. We, we couldn't um, avoid them any longer. So I think that's like one really important, really important thing. He has three kind of points from his article. So I'll give you the too long didn't read version. But the first is he says, you know, looking to the future, we have to make the most of the medium. So what is your medium? Is it Zoom? Is it a Google Classroom? Is it um, FaceTime? What, what is the medium you're, you're using? And he talks a lot about this idea that we, and I mentioned it earlier, that we cannot present a facsimile of what we were doing before the pandemic or our art and our teaching will only feel like an echo of what it was before. You have to design for the medium. We have to be creative with the way we use webinar formats uh, and polling and engaging students. And, and um, you know, I've seen uh, our drama students in the, in, at Juilliard doing incredible 
monologues and dialogue performances using this tiny uh, box that, you know, that's created with their webcam and trying to find ways to connect through the materials that they have. And I think that's going to push our teaching artists and our um, administration and our faculty and all the people um, that are involved in the creation of artistic experience to think outside of the box or the webcam for what it's worth. Um, another major thing that Doug talks about that I'm really thinking a lot about these days is that old economics won't work in a new era. Um, if your model is on ticket sales or revenue sales or donations uh, that are related to a physical space and th that we've had for centuries, really, at least two centuries, um, if people can't fill those spaces, if the New York Philharmonic can only fill uh, David Geffen Hall, which seats, I think, around 2,000 people, only can fill it with 600 socially distanced people, the economics of that will not work. So why would we go back to a system that maybe is, wasn't working really before? I mean, we already knew that ticket sales weren't um, supporting our uh, arts nonprofits before this. So why would we go back to uh, a world where there's um, only one um, kind of revenue and one kind of model. We need hybrid digital and live models to sustain us uh, both economically and artistically. And those hybrid models really include this idea that um, going back to making the most of the medium, really thinking through the design for the screen and the camera and thinking through what new ways can uh, digital video and uh, you know 4k recording and all those great kind of film uh, aspects extend the artistic experience that we're uh, having and that's not just for performing arts that could be for lectures or classrooms or interviews or anything else um, but we're going to need new models to sustain this economically and artistically and then the last kind of major point here is that the rapid transition um, to online instruction or performances or whatever your area is has caused us to look at these barriers and the friction that we face on a level um, that we have forgotten about in our, in our in-person offerings. So what is the friction? This kind of goes back to the, the first part of my pinwheel, the barriers. What makes it difficult to experience the art? Is it a uh, not understanding how to use the technology on the user end? Is it lots of ways to click to find things? Are we not being clear in our descriptions? Are we um, presenting things that the audio quality isn't great? All, any, what we find with um, our online threshold for uh, rejection is that it's much, much um, easier to say, well, this is too difficult. I can't find it. I can't find what I'm looking for. And so we have been thrust into a world where that has uh, all of a sudden become a very high value for all of us who are creating uh, interesting, uh, interesting artistic experiences. And so when we go back to uh, hybrid models and we're going back into live person convenings, those pain points are going to be much more fresh. Why is it difficult to get a ticket to this event? Why is it difficult to do X, Y, and Z? Why can't I get up and take a break? Why can't um, I get a further explanation that I could just, while I'm watching the, this you know, opera, I could just go over here and Google and get a quick uh, response to the question I have about the plot. We're gonna see those things happen in classrooms and you know, a variety of ways. And so I think we have to really think about removing all those pain points uh, as we go back in introducing you know, hybrid and, and digital models. So these are some of the things that I wanted to discuss today. Um, I'm gonna end my screen share really quickly. So I, I really appreciate um, everything. And uh, I wanted to wrap up with that, just saying that um, these kinds of um, creative experiences, the sky's the limit now. And I think we should look at the experiences we have now as an opportunity to explore change uh, for the future. So thanks uh, everyone and uh, I think that's it for me.